Okay, um, welcome to Shoot Festival, everybody. I think we're live now. We just had a bit of a momentary lag. Um, it's wonderful to be with you all this evening. Uh, my name's Caroline Eden. I've been traveling through, reporting on, and writing about Central Asia for about the last 12 years. Um, in the past, I've reviewed Hamid's books for the Financial Times and other publications and have spoken to Hamid about his work elsewhere. Um, I'm a big fan of his work, so I'm absolutely delighted to be in conversation with Hamid again this evening. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Hamid's work um, and his books, which include The Railway, you know, Dead Lake, and more recently, The Devil's Dance and Of Strangers and Bees. Um, both, like his latest, Manafi, are multi-stranded epics. Um, his works are currently banned in Uzbekistan, just to give you a bit of background. Um, and Hamid was forced to flee the country in 1992. He came to the UK um, and worked uh, with the BBC for many, many years. Um, and today, he's the Central Asia Director of Radio Free Europe, um, based in Prague, where he is tonight, um, while I'm joining you from Istanbul. Uh, this is a pretty global event. Uh, we've got people joining us from Taiwan, the west coast of America, Bishkek, West Kent. Um, before we kick off, I'd like to remind you that we'll make sure we leave about 20 minutes at the end for questions. So please do have a think about what you'd like to ask Penny. Um, and I'll get to as many as I can. So um, let's start with the new book, um, Manaphy, I mean, and written in what I think of as the classic Ismailov style, poetic, rebellious, witty, lyrical, um, can you begin by telling us what the Manas is and who a Manaki is? Uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting for, for, uh, to this wonderful event. Uh, thank you very much to organizers of Shoot Festival and to you, Caroline. Uh, really, really honored by so many people joining our session. Uh, showing their interest to uh, Manas, to Manaschi, to Central Asia. Uh, as you might know, and you know definitely, Central Asia is one of the uh, wonderful places for storytelling. You know, uh, on the one hand, uh, on one hand, uh, uh, if you remember a Thousand and One Nights, so Sheherazade was telling this story to the ruler of Samarkand. So it's to do with Central Asia, though uh, the stories are happening in Baghdad, in Damascus, but it's told to the ruler of Samarkand. Uh, on the other hand, with the nomadic tradition, we have uh, the epics like Manas, the biggest, the largest epic in the world, uh, the biggest epic of the humankind. Uh, to some uh, sort of accounts, for example, in some accounts, uh, it uh, uh, counts for half a million. Some people are saying even million verses. It's many, many times bigger than Iliad and Odyssey taken together. So, and all these storytelling uh, uh, wonders, they live uh, hand in hand in Central Asia. Lots of... Uh, different storytelling techniques, different stories there. So Manas is one of them. And obviously, as a person who is interested all his life in storytelling, I couldn't resist to talk about Manas. And I was uh, amazed that nobody ever written any novels about Manas or Manaschi. Maybe that is a sort of mystical taboo, you know, it's too big to discuss it, maybe. So therefore, uh, it was quite challenging for the first time to write something about Manas and Manaschi. Because Manaschi, as people, they revert like shamans, like uh, fortune tellers, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, holy people. Because it's a vocation, not everyone can go and start to recite manas. There must be a kind of uh, initiation to manas, a mystical initiation. Right. So it's a huge, huge thing, you know, to become a manaschi. But like in all our life, you know, there are sort of false uh, prophets and so on and so forth. And 
This, yeah. this leads me really nicely, actually, Hamid, onto my next question, um, which is, in the book, Bekesh wonders if a dream he has had has infected, and you use this word infected, him with the idea of becoming a Manas Bard. Can you tell us a little bit about how someone moves towards this position of inspiration and unique standing in a society? So traditionally, you have to have a, a, a initiation, and usually the initiation, to, according to those who have been initiated into becoming monastery, great monastery, usually it happens during your sleep. You are dreaming that manas or someone from uh, manas comes to you and offers you some kind of drink. Usually it's a sort of white drink, according to those who uh, were initiated. Usually it's a white drink, but uh, looking like, let's say, yogurt, looking like uh, cream maybe, but somehow of the sort of, you know, sandy consistency. It's very difficult to swallow it, apparently. But you have to uh, make an effort to swallow it, and then you're waking up initiated to become monastery. It's a force within yourself all of a sudden, the archetype, as Jung would have said, yeah, which all of a sudden develops inside of you. And you are becoming monastery without any sort of preparation and so on and so forth. You can express, you can uh, all of a sudden, you know, project the uh, uh, scenes and the, uh, stories from manas into the outside world. So that is the usual way of initiation. Uh, yeah. So how, how it, if we were talking about just, um, this isn't one of the questions I have noted down, but now I'm thinking, in Kyrgyzstan, for example, the country I most associate with manas, how many Manas Chi are there? Would you, if, if you know, I mean, living today, for example. Now too many, too many. Right. And that is the, maybe that was my story as well, you know, which I wanted to tell in Manas Chi. Unfortunately, what happens with the world now, not just with Kyrgyzstan, with the wider world, you know, many sort of, you know, false prophets and false prophethoods are around, you know, journalists, becoming the sort of, uh, you know, politicians, for example, you know, yesterday's columnists or the television stars running the sort of the whole world and so on and so forth. Lots of these kind of false prophets and false prophethoods. So this is a wider uh, this, message in the book. Yes, in a yeah. way. Mm -hmm. The same is happening uh, in Kyrgyzstan, obviously. There are too many monasteries, uh, the former actors, for example, who think they all of a sudden, if they learn by heart some scenes of manas, for example, they're becoming a proper, authentic monastery, which is not true, which is not true. Like, for example, if I uh, related to Jungian uh, psychology, yeah, uh, it's more about sort of, you know, ego, it's more about the shadow rather than self, you know, authentic self. So you are projecting not yourself as monastery, but you are projecting your sort of seemingless, seemingness of becoming monastery. Image is uh, sort of becoming your, or your mask is becoming your substance, you know. And that is maybe the story of monastery, uh, which I wrote. Mm. I think next we should talk something about the translation. Um... The translator of, of this book was Donald Rayfield, who is one of our greatest living translators in the world. And he writes in the introduction of this oral epic, he says that it's as important to the Kyrgyz as Shakespeare is to the English speaking world. Um, do you have hope um, that the book will bring Manas to a wider audience? Because I don't think many people outside of Central Asia really know very much about Manas. I mean, I know it sounds like a bit of a, probably wasn't your reason for writing it, but do you, do you hope that it will bring a, a wider knowledge? You said about the reason for, for writing. Uh, uh, 
by this particular book, all of a sudden I realized that, uh, uh, that I'm not writing to be translated, you know, because I pose so many challenges to poor uh, Donald Rayfield, you know, by this book, because uh, we were sort of back and forth, uh, sort of, you know, discussing everything, you know, and he was struggling, as I'm saying, in the catacombs of my sentences there, of my uh, uh, sort of thoughts there, and so on and so forth. And all of a sudden, ultimately I've discovered that I'm not writing for the uh, uh, translator's sake you know and in that sense I can't claim that uh, you know uh, I'm appealing to the wider world to know more about Manas or Manashti. Hopefully, as the mm. byproduct of this book uh, people might be interested because uh, I'm I'm trying to base my uh, judgment on my previous experiences. For example, The Devil's Dance, uh, a book about uh, Khwadari and uh, about the 19th century uh, uh, Bukhara, raised lots of interest towards Khwadari and towards the history of Bukhara and uh, raised lots of, and I know that for as a fact. So hopefully as a byproduct, the Manashti will raise the interest for Manas and for uh, Manashchi, mm, the authentic okay. ones. I think it will. I think people, it's fascinating. I mean, it has to, it has to have a wider audience. I think people are reading a lot more works in translation and just casting their nets further now than perhaps before. Um, and I, that, that's the other thing I sort of wanted to ask you about, the translation process, just to dig in a bit deeper. Um, Rayfield once called it a, a, a linguistic triathlon because you're working with so many different languages between the two of you. What were the joys and the challenges of working with Donald and translating together? Everything and tell us is, about the languages, you know, the like different languages. Everything languages is basically. joy with, uh, with uh, working with Donald because he is so curious person, you know. He goes uh, extra mile, for example, in understanding uh, Uzbek. For example, in order to translate, let's say, one obscene word here, he all of a sudden researched everything existing, <laughs> existing on the sort of, you know, on the fences of Tashkent and other places, you know, gathering all obscenities of Uzbekistan, yes, right. in order to rightly translate one particular obscene word, let's say. He is a wonderful, uh, uh, you know, researcher. Uh, sometimes, you know, with uh, especially with uh, translators like him, like Robert Chandler, uh, you know, who are taking their uh, uh, business very seriously, they are sometimes noticing even the mistakes, you know, factual or whatever. I wouldn't uh, sort of, you know, say uh, exactly which mistake or whatever, but if there was any mistake they would have immediately noticed you know they're incredible minds both of them yes yes and but the main thing here is how it sounds in english mm. how it sounds in english and my uh, take that people who are reading the, this translation they all of a sudden realize that this plant is not from Central Asian garden, but it's from the English garden, you know? So it relates easily to the, the you know, to understanding of uh, English men or the American or whatever. So the way how they turn, you know, all the concepts, all the, for example, one of the challenges is in Central Asia, everything especially in turkic languages everything is about the uh, you know fixed uh, cliches or let's say about the uh, sayings or proverbs they are everywhere the proverbs are everywhere but when uh, you are using as a writer that for your sort of you know for your audiences because audiences get used to it but it's a challenge in english because none of the english people are talking by the uh, you know by the uh, phrasal whatever you know idioms or uh, idiomatic uh, phrases or proverbs and so on and so forth so it's completely different set of rules and set of uh, perceptions this leaves me Sorry, Hamid. 
Yes. Continue. Yeah, no, no, no. The, the, well, that it, is the it, it leads me really nicely onto the next thing that I wanted to ask you about, which is obviously I'm familiar with your work. Uh, it's got a very mythical style, which I think is quite different to the sort of writing style that most Anglophone readers are familiar with. Um, how should the reader who isn't familiar with your work? if they're not very au okay fait with Central Asian culture and the sort of styles that you were just describing, how should they approach your, your, your work? And why do poetry and literature in Central Asia? Do they just uh, dive straight in or? Once again, you know, that is the question to uh, uh, readers themselves rather than to me as the, the author, because I'm mm -hmm. not, uh, Though it might sound rude, you know, I'm not uh, writing for an English person in the first place uh, when I'm writing. If I'm writing for uh, an English person, I'm writing in English. Yes, I do write in English and I mind, you know, how I'm writing in English because my son always sort of criticizes me and says, you know, uh, you can't have two subjects in one sentence, for example, you know, in an English sentence. Yeah. That's so the sort of I'm thing mindful I'm talking of about. that one. Yes. Uh, I'm mindful of uh, sort of, you know, uh, of uh, uh, every English sort of rule when I'm writing in English. Yes. When I'm writing, but when I'm writing in Uzbek or, or in Russian or for Central Asians, I'm following more than my Central Asian instincts, mm -hmm. and therefore I can't be a, a whole uh, can't be a whole responsible, you know, for the perception of English people of my uh, work, let's say. But I think that I should also jump in as somebody who's written reviews of your books and say. I don't want people to be misled if they're not familiar with your work. Your work is very easy to follow. It's not like you read it and you, it's, it's very confusing. I mean, the plots are very interwoven and it's, it's multi-stranded and they are epics, I think, your books, the, the three that we're talking about this evening, your informal Central Asian trilogy. But they're not difficult to follow. If you, if you, if you focus and you, and you lose yourself in the work, it's not difficult. Um, it's just that sort of slightly mythical style, which I think is quite different. Um, uh, you know, we were brought up, for example, in the Soviet Union by the American literature. Mm. All we read was American literature, which was completely strange to us culturally, uh, philologically, whatever you could take, yeah, every criteria. But that was the most interesting part of the reading these right. books. Right. Yeah. Yes. So it's the yeah. immersion that you experience. Absolutely. Reading, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, you know, you have to make an effort, for example, when I was reading Faulkner, let's say, uh, about the sort of, you know, uh, black issues, for example, yeah, in America. I had no experience whatsoever in uh, the Soviet Union, you know, of the same issues. But uh, you make an effort to understand, to go into someone else's shoes, you know. Yeah. You don't say, you know, it's impenetrable, I don't like it. You know, you try to do that is the sort of, you know, one of the things which we are lacking in our world, you know, sympathy to otherness. Mm. When we try and to be other, you know, when we try to understand the otherness, not just, you know, entrench ourselves into our own identities. And that's it. Basically, the book is about that, you know, not to be entrenched in your own so-called identity, you know, because your identity might be wrong, might be sort of flexible, might be fluid, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. it's and that's the, that's the great reward. It's not. Yeah. Mm. The, 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 the reward is how much you learn and how the, the full yeah. immersion you have in other cultures, which are so different, perhaps, to your own. Um, can we talk a little bit about the covers? I did warn you I'd want to talk about the book jackets because the current one is completely amazing. It's really interesting. Um, can you explain to us something about the cover? I think it's an amazing cover. Uh, I should admit that I didn't take any part in, you know, in creating this cover. It's uh, all uh, artists' imagination. But maybe it was, um, you know, the scene when 
in the book, if you read this book, uh, or uh, if you are planning this uh, to read this book, there is a scene when Bikesh, uh, this uh, radio presenter, who all of a sudden, uh, you know, in a sort of, you know, in a limbo, whether he uh, is a Manashti or not Manashti, in a border situation, which I love uh, the border situation. So he is uh, coming to the, you know, and uh, to the village and inheriting the eagle, the uh, horse, and uh, sort of the culture, basically. Mm. And one of the scenes is uh, talking that, uh, you know, in order to uh, deceit the eagle, he decided to put on the clothes of uh, his uncle, uh, the late uncle, in order to, to uh, sort of, you know, be in his clothes and to uh, cheat on the, uh, uh, on the eagle. But Eagle <laughs> discloses this, uh, this cheating and uh, nearly kills him. So maybe that scene gave the sort of, you know, the impulse uh, in order to make this particular uh, cover. I love it. It completely draws me in because it looks like he's in a snow globe. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's uh, yes. such an enticing, unusual cover. I really, the covers have all been fantastic. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you, this is a little bit tricky maybe, but for me anyway, is it, is it true to say that the book reflects the balance between the revival of Islam in Central Asia in its very particular form that it takes versus the outside influences which are coming into Central Asia? I got this, that feeling with the book. It is uh, uh, some part of the book. I mean, uh, as I said, you know, I love the, the you know, the um, cases, the border cases. Mm. So therefore, he is a marginal person. Yeah, he is not a fixed person. Uh, in that sense, the uh, situation in Central Asia is the border situation now. Yeah. So there are lots of choices, you know, where we are going as Central Asia, yeah, especially after the, you know, identity crisis after the Soviet Union. And the novel shows that the village, which was happy at the one, uh, once upon a time, all of a sudden uh, immerses or merges into the lots of problems of all characters, including one of them is the sort of, you know, radical Islam versus the traditional Islam of Central Asia. Mm, that was really what my question was about, because this is something we see. I mean, the, the big the big question to me after the fall of the Soviet Union, the Central Asia is all this identity building and how each country is doing it slightly differently um, and how, how people are trying to move forward with, with, with that and how they're expressing it and how the politicians are expressing it versus how the people are expressing it. Um, so to be a Manaschi, it's both a great privilege, but it also seems like it's a great weight to bear as well. Um, I wonder if the, the same can be said um, for, for people who are writing under repressive regimes in the world, uh, past and future. And I wonder if you see some parallels there as well. Um. I mean, it's too big, you know, uh, to compare uh, yourself with Manashti or whatever. Uh, I mean, it's a part of our culture, it's a part of our history, it's a part of our story and storytelling. So you have to dare to be uh, a part of that, you know, to inherit, uh, like Bikesh inherited his uh, sort of culture or tries to inherit, yeah? yeah? So in that sense, I'm in the same situation, you know, as Bikesh, for example, because lots of things are sort of, you know, uh, are you daring, for example? Are you up to this job? Are you uh, constantly checking up and, uh, uh, interrogating yourself, you know, but the, like a personality, like a society, like a culture. Yeah. So in that sense, uh, it doesn't give any, uh, you know, uh, any recipes or whatever. It's just the poses questions, you know, the book. The book yeah. is poses, uh, posing questions. As for your question, I mean, is Manashi and the authorship uh, might be similar? Uh, I'll tell you, how would you sort of, you know, perceive it? Uh, for example, when the day when I started to write this particular book, Manas, yeah? 
a fox appeared in my garden. All of a sudden, I mean, uh, there are plenty of foxes, you know, in uh, London, as you know, as you might know. But a particular big fox appeared in my garden. My wife uh, uh, always considers that it's uh, her sort of, you know, chicken bones uh, which made this fox appear. I believe that it was something more than that, you know, because that fox disappeared when I finished the, uh, every day she was in our garden oh. and disappeared when I finished my work the same so day. It so, was a vixen, a female fox. Yeah. Yes. So in that sense, you know, the, uh, how would you perceive it? You know, how would you perceive it? Is there any mysticism in that? Is there any rationality like the chicken bones, for example? You know, I would rather go for the sort of, you know, for the uh, force of Manas, for the archetype of Manas, yeah, which is acting in this world. Because the novel is saying, you know, it's not a sort of passive force. It's an active force. All yeah. our culture, all our archetypes are uh, not passive forces. They are active forces. And they are punishing when you are sort of relating to them uh, sort of, you know, uh, in a wrong way, in a false yeah. way. Mm -hmm. So we have to bear in mind this uh, sort of, you know, the, this force of our culture, this force of our language, this force of our uh, sort of, you know, uh, history. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, this kind of relates a bit to what we were saying about nation building before but i was wondering when you were saying you know there's a lot of manas chi around now in kyrgyzstan and maybe people taking it on who perhaps maybe shouldn't be um do you see that the, the the revival of, of of manas if we can call it that as part of nation building um in kyrgyzstan for example i mean it's, is it something politicians yeah, use it? yeah yeah it's the same problem as i mentioned uh, you know the seemingness uh, is much more important mm -hmm. image is uh, becoming much more important than the substance yeah and the novel reflects on that you know what a wonderful manashi would have become dapan for example this boy for example you know yeah. uh, but because of our mistakes, you know, as a society, as a community, he dies. Yeah. So lots of things like that, you know, uh, which are um, uh, the real obstacles, you know, in order to obviously, obviously, Manas is not repeating itself uh, in a sort of, you know, in a traditional form. We have to adopt all this uh, wealth of manas, yeah, in a particular way, not, for example, in a nationalistic way. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, he fought the Chinese, we have to fought the Chinese. No, it's not about that. It's about the culture, you know, it's about the uh, manas as a sort of, you know, epic, uh, about the sort of, you know, inner side of the things rather than uh, just uh, what is on the surface. That leads me into a question I have to ask you, which is not one of my questions I've got written down. And that's how frustrating it must be that, I mean, I have a lot of young friends, I consider young friends, like people under 30, in cities like Tashkent, Tashkent and Bishkek and Almaty. And I think how wonderful if they had very quick and easy access to your work. And I remember once you published some work on Facebook to make it easy for people to have access to your work. Are we moving forwards in any way of, of, of making your work more accessible to young people in Central Asia so they can read Central Asia's best current living list? I don't I mean, know where, this, we're, where we're standing with that one because I was concentrating, the, you know, in writing rather than in publishing. Though publishers, uh, they are approaching me, for example, recently uh, one Russian publisher approached me uh, and uh, uh, sort of, you know, wants to buy 14 of my Russian uh, books, uh, the right for the for, for, for publishing 14 of uh, my Russian uh, language books. So maybe yeah. through through the Russian, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not a sort of, you know, the, 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 the publisher. I am more about uh, writing. Of course, than. of course. But also people must read you. And I think it's, I just feel it's it's 
so frustrating when you're in a city like Bishkek and there's only sort of one or two bookshops and not very much of a publishing scene and you know I just yeah I, I can I can obviously take some by hand but I can only carry so many in a suitcase like you and it would be better if there was more of a easy way to get these books into um, into cities anyway uh, the, the next thing I wanted to talk about um, is we did touch on this a bit before actually and it's another thing which Donald Rayfield writes about in his lovely introduction and he talks about the ethnic conflicts in Central Asia, which is a big part of the book, and the geography of today's republics and where we find Uzbek stranded in Kyrgyzstan and Tajik stra stand stranded in Tajik and Uzbekistan and these sort of borders and the mess that they're all in. And he talks about China's Belt and Road Initiative, which I thought was interesting. Um, can you talk a bit about um, how Manas G is, as Donald Rayfield calls it, an alert to an unfolding disaster. And I realize this is potentially slightly uncomfortable, you know, discussion, but can you tell us what he means by that and what, you know, I, I mean, think, I know uh, but, yeah, it's not a political book. It's not a manifesto but the, no. or the analysis of Central Asian politics or geopolitics. Mm -hmm. uh, it concentrates on one uh, particular village, you know, a Kafkaesque village where everything is messed up. Uh, so, in that sense, uh, my job as a sort of writer, just to show maybe uh, the cultural side, the psychological, the sort of spiritual side of the things, rather than, uh, you know, geopolitical or whatever. Mm. If, uh, you know, for this sake, I would have written a sort of political article or whatever to diplomat or to politico or to other things. Uh, it's more, okay, I mean, my job is not, uh, uh, I mean, as a writer, yeah, as a writer and uh, creator of this manashchi, is not analyzing the political side of the things uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's the job of the reader to apply, you know, this culture, what's happening in the minds of people, in the hearts of uh, people, towards the politics, towards the, uh, you know, geopolitics. Yeah, so I mean, it's, I, it's, yeah. yeah. It's, it's very addictive. I mean, I always say Central Asia is so addictive and you start to understand one tiny facet and then you just need to not need to understand other things. So I, un I understand what, what you mean by, by that. Um, I've got a but couple many of questions. conflicts, uh, uh, Caroline. Many conflicts are coming exactly from the sort of entrenched uh, identities, you know, yeah. or pseudo identities. You know, we are those and not anything else. You know, we are these, but not, not anything else. There are much more sort of you know uniting uh, features of Central Asia than Absolutely. dividing ones. Yeah. Absolutely. And, it, and it's crazy when you, I mean, especially when you meet somebody and they speak five different languages. Yes. Which many yes. Central Asian people yes. do. You would think so it would be a lot easier. As soon but... as you are sort of, you know, trying to entrench your identity in something, you know, uh, it happens all over the places, you know. Okay. But if you are not nation against nation, you are sort of, you know, city against another city. If you are not city against the city, you are football club against another football club, and so on and so forth, you know. You can yeah, find all kind of, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm hostilities or which are dividing you but uh, it's better to sort of finding uniting uh, the uniting features of absolutely because we've yeah. seen historically in cities like osh what happens when it absolutely. goes really bad absolutely i've only got a few minutes left before we're opening up to questions and i'd like to end on a slightly couple more light-hearted questions um slightly whimsical silly questions if you allow me which historical figure in Central Asia would you most like to sit down and have a cup of tea with? Too many, you know. Could, uh, <laughs> Give us one many. or two. At the Dastar Khan, who would you sit down with for some chai? Uh, too many, but, uh, could, uh, you know, could, too many, too many, too many. Uh... But I luckily, luckily, I dream, you know, in my night dreams, I met nearly all of them. Oh, I love that. Okay, <laughs> yes. good. That's a lovely answer. So you're dreaming of these, of these great meetings. Yes, yes. Something else which was remarkable, which happened recently, is when two worlds collided, I was totally thrilled, although not entirely surprised, um, to see that the musician Patti Smith, who I have been a fan of since my teenage years, 
um, was reading your latest book and saying that she was enjoying it. Do you like her music? Were you familiar with her before? Are you familiar no. with her? <laughs> I should be ashamed, you know, but uh, unfortunately I wasn't. I wasn't and immediately started to look who is she, you know, and uh, all of a sudden I discovered that she was singing at the Nobel Prize for uh, Bob Dylan. Yeah, my, I'm admiring, you know, so I admire. So uh, immediately I felt uh, sort of, you know, the closeness of hearts uh, with her. But, you know, lightheartedly, I might, I might tell you that her promotion is equal to let's say to guardians promotion you know? <laughs> so she has got the power on the amazon you know when you sort of measure by the amazon uh, figures you know so she has got the power of the guardian let's say <laughs> I, I honestly i mean i was i was so pleased and I, and I and i wasn't surprised because i've read her books as well she's also a great poet and a great writer yeah. in, in her own right um Right, last question from me before we go to, to other questions. Um, your books are so good at combining traditional oral storytelling, which is such a Central Asian thing, with contemporary global fiction. Um, and we hope that, that success will mean more English translations of literature written by Uzbeks and other Central Asians. Can you, because I think people will be really interested to know, suggest to, to us um, some Central Asian writers that perhaps we're not familiar with, that we should be familiar with, could be poets, could be contemporary, or who should Once we be again, reading? Once again, too many to suggest, but uh, I mean, uh, unfortunately, they are not translated. You see, that is the problem. But uh, uh, I'll start with, uh, you know, with Kazakhstan, for example, you know, mm. uh, starting from Oljas Suleymenov, let's say, and uh, to younger poets, wonderful poetry in Kazakhstan. Ralansky yeah. Simbaev as a um, prose writer, uh, there are the elderly, the sort of, you know, elders there, like, for example, uh, mm, lots of writers, uh, I mean, Muhtar Awezov is one of the classics of uh, uh, Kazakh literature. With Kyrgyzstan, Chinggis Aitmatov, unfortunately, mm. we are forgetting the greatness of this particular writer, you know, for Central Asia. He's unfortunately... Wonderful. Yeah, he has been translated into English, but not uh, he's not famous so much in English, but in German. But he is, Chinky Zaitmatov is a wonderful writer, you know, that uh, yeah. should be promoted uh, uh, always. In Uzbekistan, you've got Murat Muhammad Dost, Erkin Azam, Usman Azim as a poet, Muhammad Saleh as a poet, lots of uh, writers, poets, Rauf Parfi as a poet, uh, poet. Lots of, lots of. Mm. I recently published uh, with the Calvert magazine the young poets, wonderful poets of Uzbekistan. We've translated their poems and published with the Calvert uh, magazine. In Tajikistan, lots of, uh, uh, for example, even uh, abroad, uh, uh, one uh, uh, Shahzad Samarkandi, for example, wonderful uh, prose writer, one of our upcoming talents of, uh, uh, or for example, Farzona is a poet. Lots of talent. In Turkmenistan, Akvel Sapar, for example, then Tirkesh Jumagildiev, Wonderful writers, wonderful poets. So a good resource for people to look at. I've forgotten, actually, because I contributed a couple as well. We did that big thing for the Calvert Journal of the 100 best. Yes. I think it was Eastern Europe, Caucasus and Central Asia. But that, that was a good resource. And you've written quite a lot, haven't you, for, for Calvert Journal yeah. about who we should be reading. So that's a good place for people to look. Um, oh, look, OK, I'm, I'm going to go with this question because someone's just typed a really nice uh, question. It's Anthony Wynn, actually. Um, for the benefit of those who have not heard the Manas, would you like to recite just a few verses so that we can get a feel of it? If you would, Hamid, I think that that, no. No, <laughs> that I, be won't. Nice. I won't be, uh, because it's, you know, you have to have a vacation for that one. Okay. I don't want to become a false prophet like <laughs> my character, you know. Like the people you were just talking about. Yeah, because like, I'm afraid of retribution. Okay, fair enough. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, but, uh, as a matter of fact, I can send the link, you know, to the Shoot Festival of 
the best reciter of uh, uh, yeah, best reciter of Manas uh, on YouTube. That would be great. So, oh, so we, this is yeah. something we can watch on YouTube. That's, yes. that's great. Okay. Um, right now, some of the questions we've got coming in here. I'll start from the top. Um, this is Nodira or Nodra. A question about identity from someone who left the motherland a long time ago. Does Hamid consider returning to the motherland now that political regimes are changing or is that bridge burnt? That's obviously an incredibly sensitive personal question. Uh, for, I mean, but it's not one that everyone's probably wondering. It's quite a pragmatic not... one, you know, because in uh, 2017, on the 1st of March, I came to uh, Uzbekistan uh, as a part of the BBC delegation. Everyone was allowed into Uzbekistan. I was deported. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that is the question, not to me. That's where we are at the moment, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, got a question here from Peter Frankopan. Hello, Peter. It's like, very nice of you to join us. Um, what does the future hold for Uzbek writing? Might we see a golden age in 10 years' time? Dare we hope for a blossoming of the creative arts in general from the next generation? That's a nice question. Um, how do you feel about, about that? Uh, I feel a sort of uh, ambiguously. The one thing, uh, what I'm discovering in Uzbekistan is, uh, I mean, there is always talent. There is always talent. But at the same time, you know, the, mm, the situation in the sort of, you know, political or in the society, in the society, uh, limits these talents more and more, you know, as they develop. Mm. And you are becoming sort of pressurized, not just by the sort of, you know, by the authorities, yeah, uh, who are always pressurizing writers to write a, uh, particular or certain type of literature, but by, by your peers as well, you know, there is this uh, kind of uh, rule of the games, basically, you know, a, rule of the, a manual uh, the, of the rules, you know, of the game, of the literature, which you have to follow. In that sense, you know, I looked always historically, for example, to the best, uh, you know, achievements of the Central Asian mind. You know, for example, Al Farabi was writing in Damascus. Ibn Sina was writing somewhere else. You know, so uh, lots of things which were created somewhere else. You know, because this pressure. Is not existent, uh, uh, let's say, abroad. Your peers pressure, the authorities pressure, uh, so the sort of, you know, readers pressure as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, because readers pressure means quite a lot as well, you know. For example, My Devil's Dance was. Uh, has become a sort of, you know, uh, quite a controversial thing, uh, especially among the Uzbek women. So Uzbek women divided, uh, were divided into two camps, you know, which were fighting each other uh, vehemently uh, because some of them, they were sort of, you know, saying why this Mr. Ismailov is bringing the sort of, you know, uh, all the secrets of our women to the outside world. Uh, others were saying, uh, so in that case, kill uh, Tolstoy for writing uh, uh, Anna Karenina and so on and so forth. So mm -hmm. there is this pressure of the readers as well, uh, which then makes you submit to them as well, you know, in order to, uh, if you want to become one of the popular writers in your country, etc., etc. So there are lots of dif uh, different kinds of pressures. And if the talents might deal with them. So then I am very optimistic because there are lots of talents there, but these pressures are still existing. Mm. Thank you, Hami. Um, just looking for some other questions. We've got quite a few coming in. Um, mm, that's a nice one from Jackie Erlon. I was wondering if Hami can speak more on the folklore elements of his stories. And that's quite a broad question, but maybe you could cherry yeah, pick one yeah. or two. Which... Uh, as I said, you know, Central Asia is 
uh, is uh, a place where two kind of uh, cultures that were existing for last, uh, let's say, 10 centuries. On uh, one hand, the written culture, very much developed, uh, uh, leaning towards the sort of Arabic culture and Islamic culture, Arabic, Persian culture. And on the other hand, uh, we have a richness and wealth of the oral culture, which is more of Turkey, of the sort of authentic uh, nomadic culture. And these are two elements which constitute the, you know, the psyche of the Central Asia. And uh, you can't say that one is richer, another one is poorer, one is more important, another one is uh, less important. They are different and they are equal in their power and in their uh, potency. Yeah. So I'm trying to use both sides of these cultures, you know, as much as I'm using the uh, richness and uh, sophistication of the written culture, uh, to the same extent, I'm trying to use the power, the raw power of the oral culture. Mm, that's a great answer. Thank you, Hamid. Um, this is a nice general question. Um, can you tell us some of the books that you are currently reading or the sort of books that you like in general? So are you a nonfiction person? Are you a fiction person? Do you read poetry? What kind of books do you like to read? I'm not reading now, I'm listening to books because of my eyesight uh, deteriorating, so I'm keeping it for writing books, therefore I'm uh, uh, listening to books. And I must say that I'm listening to more books than I used to read books. Hmm. I'm listening to many, many books. I, I, for example, I listen to all books which I uh, dreamt to read, you know, uh, which I never read or haven't had chance to read. Yeah. So I listen to everything, everything. And that uh, feeds my sort of oral sight as well, you know, That's because, nice. because uh, perception is completely different. Perception mm -hmm. is much, much, much more uh, sort of, you know, subtle and much more uh, rich perception of the books. Recently, for example, <laughs> I can tell you 10 books which I uh, listened recently, but uh, main books which I listened to, for example, this month. Uh, I listened to uh, Underground of a wonderful Russian writer, underrated Russian writer, uh, Vladimir Makanin. Wonderful book, uh, the, uh, Underground, which is called Underground. It has been translated into English. Then I started to listen to, but when I'm tired of uh, serious books, I usually listen to Tristram Shandy mm. of Lawrence Stern. I enjoy every phrase of this book, you know, it's just for, for the sake of listening, you know, yeah. enjoying. That's the lovely. same happens uh, to me when I'm reading Abdullah Qadri in Uzbek. Mm -hmm. And another book. Now I'm listening today, for example, I was listening with such an, uh, uh, joy to Babur Nama of Babur. Mm. Especially today, I was listening to, uh, to the scene when he was, you know, thinking: Should he drink, start to drink, or shouldn't he start to drink? He's such a gastronome. He's so greedy. That's why I love him. Because you love—I mean, food is—I don't want to get onto this. This is my topic, but yes. food is so ingrained in Central Asia, and Baba really understood the joys yes. of yes. eating a good Uzbek melon. <laughs> so I'm always sort of, you know, uh, uh, swapping sort of serious books, which I'm reading for hmm. certain things, for example, to understand better Russia or whatever, with yeah. something just purely in for the uh, pleasure. Like are, you a are you a radio person, Hammy? Do you listen to the radio? To radio as well, yeah, yeah. but mostly to music, classic music. Thank classic you. being uh, uh, not just the uh, Western classic, but uh, all kind of classic. Mm. Um. This is a nice question. What is the relationship? This has come from the Sheep Festival, I think. So maybe Bijan or Sam. Uh, what is the relationship between Central Asian Islam and the Manashche's idea of initiation? Do people see a tension between them? Or is the vision of the monastery seen as complementary to the ideas of Islam? That's from Bijan. 
Yes. Uh, uh, once again, you know, with Islam, uh, usually what uh, happens in the West, you know, we are considering Islam as a monolith thing, you know, mm -hmm. uh, just one uh, huge monolith thing. In fact, Islam is so diverse in its sort of existence throughout the world, you know. For example, in the Central Asia, let's say, uh, Uzbek Islam or Tajik Islam is completely different uh, with historically with the Kyrgyz Islam or Turkmen Islam or with the Kazakh Islam. In fact, what used to happen, uh, the uh, traditional Islam was always adopted to the local needs through the, usually through the Sufism. For example, uh, Ahmad Yassavi adopted, let's say, the Islam for the sort of nomadic people, yeah? Uh, he retold uh, the Quran, for example, in his hikmats, retold for the local people in their own language. The same has happened, let's say, with the, uh, with the uh, Persian people as well. Uh, why we are saying that Masnavi of Mavlavi has the Quran Darzabani Pahlavi. We are saying that uh, Masnavi of Mavlavi is Quran in the Pahlavi language, which is Persian language. So they've adopted through uh, Masnavi, let's say, their type of uh, uh, Islam. When I'm saying they are adopting, they're adopting it to the local cultures, to the local uh, creeds, to the local beliefs, and so on and so forth. In that sense, for example, the Wahhabi Islam or Salafi Islam would have uh, immediately sort of, you know, renounced the manas and manashti and so on and so forth. Whereas, in the local tradition, that was the harmonic sort of coexistence of uh, shamanistic uh, uh, the parts of the uh, manas with the Islamic parts. Mm -hmm. uh, when we read the uh, manas, manas is always was fighting as an Islamic figure. You know, he was converting people to Islam wherever he conquered the places to a certain kind of Islam which was a traditional Central Asian, uh, semi-nomadic, let's say, or semi-shamanic, uh, let's say, semi-Tangrian Islam. Mm -hmm. So there is this sort of, you know, luft of adopting Islam for your own cultures and for your own needs. Mm. Thank you. I'm going to just say we've got about five minutes left. If anybody's got any other questions, now's the time. I've got another question I'm going to take. But if anyone has a last minute question they'd like to ask Hamid, now is your chance. Um, Anthony Wynne asks, there are national manas reciting competitions in Kyrgyzstan. What is the right time and place to recite the manas? I like that question. The right uh, time and place. I don't know the protocol, but they are reciting whenever uh, there are listeners, you know. Generally, mm -hmm. the manashti, the manashti, the real manashti, they used to recite it for people rather than for anything else. When people gathered for, let's say, for marriage, for uh, circumcision or whatever, they used to recite manas as, a, as an entertainment and education as well. So uh, now they are sort of, you know, culturizing it or civilizing it. Uh, they are arranging all kinds of festivals and so on and so forth, which is not the authentic way of, uh, not the raw and wild way of telling manas to people. So, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I personally have nothing against that, but uh, it creates a sort of, you know, a kind of, uh, appointment type of performance type of uh, feature to Manas, which is against the nature of Manas. Mm. So to wrap up, I have to ask the inevitable question. We've been on an incredible journey with you, with these three books, which Tilted Access Press, your publisher, called the, um, the Informal Central Asian Trilogy. How long do we have to wait for something else? Are you able to give us a hint about anything you're working on in the future or what we might be able to look forward to from you? I'm in the stage of bottleneck, you know, there are three things already ready to go, but uh, wow. I'm looking for the publishers uh, now. 
uh, they are translated already into English or written in English. So there are three novels which are waiting. And one, a huge novel, Russian Matryoshka, in five novels, uh, which are sort of, you know, like Matryoshka, one yeah, inside of another, uh, uh, has been now in the process of translation. Wow. So there's a lot happening and we just have to be patient. Uh, with translation, uh, unfortunately, it's the case, you know, for example, Manas was written in 2015, but it's coming just now. So Yeah, it's a lot. It's I a might have process. forgotten lots of things, so sorry about that. <laughs> okay, uh, so we're going to start drawing things, things to a close now. Hamid, I'd like to say thank you so much for being here with us this evening and for sharing your thoughts and for answering all my questions and everybody else's questions. Um, it's been really inspiring and really fascinating. Um, everybody's, you know, putting in the comments that they've really enjoyed it. And, um, Thank you very gonna... much for your patience and for your interest and curiosity. Uh, Central Asian culture is very, very interesting one, I believe me. Absolutely. So whenever uh -huh. you have a chance, go there, talk to people, talk to Manasji, talk to uh, all kinds of people. You and, and, buy, and buy Hamid's books. There are links within this chat, I think somewhere at the top, um, where you can click on the link to, to buy Hamid's books. But they're available everywhere in all good bookshops online. Um, and I must also say, as someone who's representing Shoot Festival this evening, um, please do follow along for, for, for events which are, which are still to come on Crowdcast and on Twitter for updates. Uh, next week, there's an event on mental health during the pandemic. Uh, with Dr. Lucy Maddox and Paddy McGrain. And um, once more, enormous thanks, Hamid, for dialing in from Prague this evening. I know it's quite late where you are, um, and, and for sharing with us so many interesting insights. Thank you, Caroline. And I have to promote Caroline's books. You know, they're <laughs> wonderful, award-winning books. So please have a look at uh, Red Sands and other books. Uh, which Thank Caroline you very much, has. Hamid. Yes. It's a pleasure to see you. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, everybody. And thank okay. you, everyone. Thank you. Good night from Istanbul and good night from Prague. Prague. Thank you. Bye. Bye.